Welcome everybody. Today is really an opportunity to uh, learn more about the specialization verification framework and the value it might add, whether you decide to go ahead um, with an application or not, there's value in it for everybody. We are going to have a quick presentation around how this has come around and what it's all about. Then the real focus of our meeting today will be the opportunity for us to have a discussion with our um, panel. Pauline, Peter, Andrew and Tony are all joining us today with lots of insight and experience to be able to support that conversation. So thank you all very much for being here. It's really valuable for all of us to learn from you. We'll also have a very brief conversation about what the application process is and then have an opportunity for a bit of a Q&A session at the end. Most importantly, while the specialisation verification framework is new, our responsibility to be delivering services that are safe and inclusive for all older people is absolutely not new. As part of the aged care quality standards, all providers are required to demonstrate that they deliver care that is safe and inclusive for all older people, including people with all sorts of experiences, circumstances, identities, and needs. And that a really fundamental component of the aged care quality standards is that we not only um, are respectful of people's diversity, but that we are set up to support um, and understand and be equipped to deliver care that is inclusive for all older people. So certainly that is a core part of the aged care quality standard. Standard one talks all about um, uh, being able to deliver respectful and inclusive care. And that is the standard that then underpins all of the other quality standards. Many people will be aware that the aged care quality standards are currently under review. Um, so while the standards, the numbers will change in the standards, certainly that expectation will not. Um, and if anything, that's really being strengthened. Uh, same with the Aged Care Act. So in the Aged Care Act, um, it certainly talks about our responsibility to recognise and respond to diversity within the community. And the current version of the Act identifies um, a number of what they call special needs groups. Um, and that's really, again, about um, identifying um, diversity within our community. The Aged Care Act is also under review. But again, that um, message around um, inclusion is being strengthened, although um, it appears that we'll probably be moving away from that language of special needs group, which I think is um, a benefit because uh, that's probably not the most inclusive language. Um, again, being able to have services that are tailored to us and what's right for each person is also part of the Charter of our Aged Care Rights. And then more specifically, in terms of responding to diversity, um, a few years ago, the aged care diversity framework was introduced, and that really outlined some more specific kind of um, practices in terms of um, being able to demonstrate that we're equipped to deliver inclusive practice for everyone. The Aged Care Act does um, identify, as I said, um, nine different special needs groups. And I think perhaps what is most important to recognise uh, is that these are not nine mutually exclusive um, communities or groups of people. There is a lot of overlap within and between the special needs groups and certainly that there is a huge amount of diversity within um, each of these special needs groups. Uh, there is certainly not one way to work with um, people in rural and remote communities and then one different way that we know works to working with veterans. The commonality, I guess, um, is that what we recognise is that people who might identify with these special needs groups may experience additional barriers or challenges in terms of accessing safe and inclusive care for a whole range of different reasons. Some of those common challenges might have been related to experiences of trauma, grief and loss, Certainly um, for a number of the special needs groups, there have been um, really challenging histories and public policies 
and um, experience of district discrimination and stigma that have set people up to be excluded and not have the opportunity to participate in the community um, in the same way. That there is a big flow on effect for many people around that um, social exclusion and experience that uh, ends up people being at higher risk of having limited access to resources and support, um, becoming more isolated and uh, potentially having um, challenges with communication as well. So some of those barriers can really um, come to play right throughout the way that people engage with services, whether that be being able to access information that is relevant and appropriate to them, uh, being able to navigate the service system, which can be complex um, for the best of us, um, Engaging with providers in making sure that providers are set up in a way to deliver services that are appropriate and um, meeting people's needs. There is huge value in understanding the diversity in our community. And when we think about um, being set up to be able to deliver care that is inclusive, it's not just about being able to um, deliver care that is responsive to the diversity within your existing consumer group and the clients who are currently accessing your services, but really thinking about um, all of the diversity that you can't see or don't currently count um, and thinking about the needs of your whole community. So there certainly might be um, people within your community that are missing out on services altogether, but it is very likely that there's a whole lot of diversity that you can't see. I also just want to acknowledge up front that um, diversity isn't a problem or challenge we're trying to um, address. Diversity is just about um, acknowledging and celebrating the fact that we are all different and that everybody's experience is unique and that we need to be um, set up to deliver services that are inclusive to all older people's experiences, circumstances and needs. It's not about um, diversity being adversity. It's just about acknowledging that we're all different. So that idea of a one-size-fits-all system is not appropriate. I think um, in the past, some of the kind of messages that I've heard from lots of staff have been around, um, we're inclusive because we treat everybody the same. But that idea of certainly I think that comes with really good intentions about delivering care that is um, respectful. But we want to move away from that idea of being equitable in terms of treating everybody the same to looking at um, creating equity and inclusion. And really that means not treating everyone the same, but recognising that what we want to do is set everybody up for success. So provide everybody with the support and resources that is right for them so they have the same opportunity to succeed and have a positive experience. As an organisation, that means understanding and mitigating some of those barriers at an organisational level and um, the way that our services are set up and delivered. But also understanding diversity helps us um, be set up to deliver care that is more flexible and tailored. It allows us to ask better questions and have conversations in a different way and make sure that we're not making assumptions about people. So all of those things put together are really about delivering person-centred practice, which is obviously what we are all trying to do and are required to do. I want to acknowledge absolutely that today's session is not about um, providing education around inclusive service delivery for our LGBTI communities. This is just a very, very, very broad overview of a couple of key things to keep in mind. As with, in my experience, all elements of diversity and um, service delivery, I think even more broadly than that, um, the language and terminology that people and communities use is all different. Um, so certainly working with um, our LGBTI communities, is a really good example of that. So um, people might be familiar with lots of different acronyms, LGBTI, LGBTIQ+, LGBTQIA+. Uh, there are lots of different terminologies. Um, we will be using um, the acronym LGBTI today 
because for a lot of older people, um, they do not identify with the word queer because it has come from a context where that word was used with a lot of violence and discrimination associated with that. I just want to acknowledge as well, though, that um, everybody will identify differently. So it's really important when you're working with people to talk to them about how they identify and what's meaningful to them. Um, this is just the language that we're going to be using today. Um, again, the LGBTI community is not one community, but there are lots of different communities made up of a huge number of individuals, all with their own experiences and background and um, context. Um, big picture, our best statistics say that um, our community includes about 11% of people who identify as LGBTI. And uh, older people represent that same diversity in terms of um, their genders, uh, sexuality, sex, relationships um, as the broader population as well. So we can make an assumption um, that the LGBTI communities make up about 11% of our broader community. One of the commonalities and key reasons why LGBTI older people are identified as a special needs group is because of the really significant experiences of discrimination and stigma that have been um, experienced in these communities. For many people, um, it was really unsafe to disclose their sexuality or relationships potentially, and there are long lasting impacts on that for people. We need to be really thoughtful of um, how people might feel about their safety in terms of being able to disclose aspects of their identity. Uh, certainly inclusive practice is not about um, forcing people to disclose their identity, but about creating a safe place for dis disclosure if that's appropriate. And regardless of whether people um, disclose, then um, being able to deliver inclusive practice that is tailored to each person's needs. The other thing that I think is really important is um, that we're not making assumptions that all older people are cisgendered and heterosexual um, or that old people um, no longer identify as um, with any kind of um, sexuality or anything like that, that relationships are suddenly no longer important and valid to older people, which unfortunately is sometimes an assumption that persists. Pauline, is there anything that's um, very, very broad, obviously, um, but is there anything that you wanted to just add there? One of the things, I guess we don't know how many people there are because it hasn't been safe for people to disclose mm -hmm. and there isn't um, any reliable or um, Australian um, data collection with regard to people's um, gender, uh, sexuality or relationships other than a couple of questions on the ABS. So suffice to say, for all providers, you probably already have LGBTI plus people accessing your care and support, but most definitely people are looking for safe and inclusive service providers and uh, specialisation verification enables them at least to um, identify service providers that are doing something. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Um, the other thing that you also mentioned, Kate, was um, disclosure. Please don't use disclosure as a measure of success. For yeah. many older people, they won't disclose, but the fact that they can access safe um, and inclusive care and support is the important thing. It's not about data collection. It's about being able to um, safely access care and support. Yeah, thanks, Pauline. I think that's a really good point. Um, one of the things that I often say is the, um, setting up inclusive services is not dependent on disclosure or not dependent on um, what diversity you can count. It's about being, yeah, set up to deliver services that are safe and inclusive for everybody, regardless of disclosure. So um, I have seen a, a few organisations that have started setting up KPIs around disclosure or trying to um, count um, different members of different communities, and that's certainly 
um, not what I think would be considered best practice. Let's look at the specialisation verification framework, where it's come from and what it's all about. Everyone, I'm sure, is very aware of the Royal Commission um, into Aged Care and Recommendation 30 really talked about the need for the sector to be better at um, inclusive practice for everybody, recognising and responding to the diversity within our community. Looking at diversity as core business, it's not an um, optional extra, it's not an add-on, it's not a nice to have. Diversity should be core business for all providers. And in the past, um, organisations were able to self-identify or nominate um, whether they felt that they delivered specialised services for um, people from different special needs groups. But the Royal Commission really identified that we needed to have more reliable information about um, that process. So introducing verification to ensure that the information that was available to people was going to be reliable and people could make more informed choices. So the specialisation um, verification framework was developed by the Australian Healthcare Associates, so AHA, um, with input from a whole range of people, including consumers and experts, peak bodies, and also service providers. Um, and mid last year, so in June 2022, um, applications were um, beginning to be assessed. As we said before, everybody has a responsibility to be able to demonstrate that you are set up to deliver safe and inclusive services. The specialisation verification framework really um, is set up to enable you as an optional kind of next step to demonstrate that you are going above and beyond and that you are um, equipped to be able to deliver specialised services um, for people that are certainly set, um, sensitive to the needs of people, but also that you're going above and beyond those standard ob obligations of the aged care quality standards. Within the framework, there are specific criteria um, that are set up that you need to be able to provide evidence that you meet, um, and I'll talk you through afterwards um, what that looks like. And there's also a process where clients and carers provide feedback to AHA around um, whether the service provider does in fact deliver care that is perceived to be safe and inclusive. I mentioned earlier, um, well, and I think Lisa and I both mentioned that whether you decide to go ahead to apply for a specialisation verification framework, there is real value in understanding the framework for everybody really helps us provide that kind of benchmark for what good practice looks like and can give you some really good insight into how you can continue to progress your quality improvement towards um, inclusive practice. So we'll talk more about that um, as we go. The key difference, I guess, for um, providers that achieve verification is that older people and assessors and the community will be able to identify services that are verified. Um, and as Pauline said, it is really important for lots of people, regardless of whether they feel um, safe to disclose aspects of their identity, it's really important that people are able to find services that um, are equipped to deliver safe and inclusive care. So that information, when people are verified, becomes available on the Find a Provider tool. When you are looking for um, providers that are able to provide support, you can refine your search based on things that are important to you. And one of those is being able to deliver specialised care. Assessors or anyone in the community can look up and identify whether they want to be um, just searching or um, limiting their search to services that are verified. It's important to recognise that the specialisation verification framework only applies to specialisation related to the nine special needs groups identified in the Aged Care Act. 
There are additional um, filters that people can put on in terms of things like um, the health support. So being able to support people with dementia, for example, people of certain faiths um, or languages. Um, those are still things that organisations will self-nominate. So that's not included within the specialisation verification framework. It's just this first drop down box around specialised care. This is an example, a screenshot from the Finder Provider Tool, and this one's from um, CoHealth. You'll see that they have achieved specialisation for a number of special needs groups. And when you look at that, you can see that there will be a tick. It also goes on to tell you how they met that criteria. So for example, people at risk of homelessness, uh, CoHealth is funded to provide specialised services. Whereas for LGBTI people, um, CoHealth has rainbow tick accreditation and that's how they achieve their specialisation. So you can actually look and see that level of detail in the Find a Provider tool. than being able to identify um, what's available and who's available that has um, verification. It really supports older people to be able to make um, more informed decisions and be able to feel confident that services are going to be equipped to um, understand um, their experiences and be set up in a way to um, support inclusion. Well, that's um, really important and essential for older people. We also know that um, assessors really rely on the information that's available about organisations in the Finder Provider tool to be able to make um, their referrals and make appropriate referrals as well. So we would certainly hope that um, verification information would also be able to support assessors, make um, better referrals and more appropriate referrals along the way. As an organisation, absolutely being able to achieve your verification really demonstrates that you are going above and beyond and um, are, have a real focus on um, inclusion in your workplace so that people can find services that are the right fit for them. In bigger picture, thinking about being able to demonstrate what sets you apart as an organisation. So when you're thinking about promoting your services or marketing your services to the community, that verification is a really good way to demonstrate um, the work that you are doing. Um, and bigger picture for everybody, really looking at um, what the benchmark is for inclusive practice. And in terms of verification, um, it is not incredibly difficult to, you know, there isn't actually a huge amount of work that is required for verification. So um, we can look at that. There is lots of um, the criteria that relate to work that you'll probably already be doing um, and or, or might be thinking about doing. So it might help you understand the next steps for your organisation as well. Before we sort of kick into the discussion, I might just ask Pauline, Andrew, Peter and Tony, if you would be willing just to give us a sort of one sentence introduction about who you are and um, the kind of experience that you might be able to share with us today. I'm Pauline Cromary. I'm the coordinator of VELS LGBTI Ageing and Aged Care. And VELS is a program of Rainbow Health Australia at the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society. We're here to support you to be able to understand and meet the needs of older LGBTI plus people accessing or perhaps not accessing uh, your care and support. And most importantly, we offer a range of information, resources and training to enable you to understand and meet needs. And most definitely, um, we have a range of workshops coming up with regard to specialisation verification framework and LGBTI people. And we'll share more information about that um, as we go through this morning's session. Andrew, over to you. I'm Andrew Rogers. My pronouns are he and him, and I work very closely with Pauline. I am part of the VALS team as well, and so play a, a role with Pauline in making sure not only that service providers 
are informed about what LGBTI inclusive practice is, but also we do a lot of work with empowering older people from the communities to understand their rights and to understand what things like specialisation verification might mean for them when they're searching for services and care providers. Peter, time to shine. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Peter. I'm an out, out and very proud um, older gay man. Um, no, Pauline and Andrew well. I think it's important for me and people like me to be here um, because our personal experience, just seeing a face of somebody who's saying, I need you, um, is important. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be here and I've got lots of things to say. Fantastic. Thank you, Peter. And Tony, bringing it home strong to round out our team. Thank you, Kate, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, um, well, I, I sort of fit into the transgender ver um, aspect of LGBTI. Um, and our special, and I'm, I'm sort of 80, I've been around a bit, and uh, I've been getting aged care services uh, for 10 years. And uh, I think it's important that um, we do everything we can um, to make sure that transgender or um, non-binary people are accepted. Um, we have a, a particular situation that is not often um, recognised um, by people, um, even within the LGBT I community, and uh, that is for a lot of trans and gender diverse and non-binary people, um, we we can't um, we can't hide who we are, and that can create all sorts of interpersonal uh, situations that um, become very uncomfortable um, mm. for both the uh, trans person, but also for the um, care provider. And uh, it's important that we have um, the community of um, aged care providers, staff, understand that generally um, trans people are only different from everybody else by one relatively small aspect of their being and uh, I'm glad to be here to help explain that uh, to people uh, that are participating in this panel as required. Thanks Kate. Thanks Tony. That's a really good way for us to kick off just with that reminder that um, how anyone identifies um, well, uh, you know, whether it be their um, gender or sexuality or sex, whatever it might be, is just one aspect of our identity. And the way that each person experiences that aspect of their identity is also going to be really different. So um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not as though, as I said before, we are looking to say there's um, one way of working with any community. Um, we are all different. So I think that is um, a fantastic way to kick off our discussion. I've got a few key questions that I'm hoping to ask the panel and really just um, have a fairly free-flowing discussion and see what pops up along the way. I'd like to start, and Andrew, I might um, point this one to you to start with, just to get us started. And I would like to ask, what do you think might impact on your decision about whether an aged care service is a good fit for you? What I would like to see is what evidence they can produce for me if I'm asking questions. How do they respond to questions about inclusion for people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or have an intersex variation? And even in the initial kind of looking around the place to find service providers or to find out what they're, they're doing, what's on the website? What, what evidence is there? What can you show me that might lead me to have a level of comfort in having a conversation with you? So it's right from the very beginning, those first initial looking at what are you telling me? 
about what work that you're doing. And specialisation verification is, of course, going to make that easier. But I think one of the interesting things there, of course, is that it is an opt-in thing. You know, organisations will choose to which specialisation verifications they have. So that is going to make it, on the one hand, easier to find them. But secondly, it's also going to make me hesitant. What happens if there's none in my area or nobody's doing it? Having the information, what are the visible signs? What evidence can you produce? If you've got specialisation verification, especially tier one, that gives me confidence to actually have the conversations with you. Fantastic. I think that idea of that messaging, what can you see, is a really good one right from the beginning. So it might be information on your website, but even um, cues in the environment and things like, you know, having, do you have pictures of all um, straight, white, heterosexual people, you know, um, displayed either, you know, in person or in your brochures or whatever, or is there diversity in the um, imagery and things that are included as well? Yeah, that's a really um, great start. Thank you, Andrew. What about for you, Peter? What might be some other things that um, might impact on whether you think an organisation is a good fit for you or what you might be aware of for other LGBTI older people? Within our diverse group, there's a whole lot of diversity. Yeah. So I agree with Andrew that that people like him, maybe people like myself, um, we're up front and we will disclose and we'll ask questions and we'll do all that stuff. There are some people who who are a little bit more res- reticent to be that out. Um, and so the rainbow tick thing is a start. It at least means that they've got somewhere to go. Um, I think it's important to then know that when, like, um, a little bit of history, I care for a lady who needed a home care package, package. I helped her do that. One of the things that made us decide who we would pursue was our initial contact because we disclosed up front and there's a thing about how people react. Um, and that was important for us. Um, but I, I think the rainbow tick is really clever because it will it will help those people who are not so connected with their community, not so open about their their life to at least head towards a good service. Um, Saying that, that means that they really, really do have to get into that rainbow tick thing. If you, if I go and connect in with that group, and I'm a quiet, retiring, um, older man, and suddenly I've got people saying, what happened to your wife? Hello? Um, That doesn't work for me. Yeah, absolutely. So it's certainly something um, you've got to walk the walk, uh, absolutely, if you are, um, whether it's through rainbow tick accreditation or um, meeting other criteria for the specialisation verification framework. It's not a matter of getting that tick and then moving on and going about standard business. It's really about being able to integrate inclusive practice into the way you work, you work day in, day out. I, I just want to say that um, the lady that I care for is a lesbian woman and she's in care at the moment in, in the hospital. The number of times you say 11%, which means 89% are not our, our team, um, the number of times that I've been asked in that hospital by official hospital people is Maggie your wife. Mm. That idea of just making assumptions about people, I think, is a, is a really important one to think about, um, and being able to be equipped to ask questions um, in a more inclusive way. So you know, if the old standard way of asking about someone's social situation might have been are you married? How many children do you have? How often do they visit? Um, that actually excludes lots of people for lots of different reasons. So, yeah, and is making assumptions and potentially forcing people to disclose information that, that they don't want to um, instead of what we're actually really trying to do is understand who you are and the context of, um, you know, what's happening in and who's around you, those kind of things. So, yeah, that's it. Excellent point. Thank you, Peter. Tony, is there anything else that 
um, you, you would look for or that you're aware of in terms of important kind of cues that might show you that a service is potentially going to be inclusive and safe for you? Um, well, I'm a little bit different to Andrew and uh, um, Peter um, in my approach to what's got to be done. Um, I, I generally, I prefer to work at the coalface um, rather than at the organisational level. And uh, it's very hard to um, develop a useful indicator um, as to how the staff of an organisation is going to be a fit for for yourself when you're the you're the service recipient and uh, your major contact is with um, staff on a day to day basis. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the one of the indicators that I use and um, I must admit I've never had to go through the the selection process. Um, since the rainbow tick uh, has been around um, because I've been getting services for for 10 years. And uh, um, I think what what you need to uh, have access to is um, personal experiences from other people about how the service has treated LGBTI people. Um, um, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are two things that are, are possible to do. Um, one is um, um, refer back to uh, organisations like VALS and whoever maintains the Rainbow Tick accreditation um, to enable you to get contact with um, community members that are already being um, serviced by that organisation. Mm-hmm. And they may, they'll probably be there and have not um, gone through any um, review of the, the organisation's uh, publicity or anything. Um, um, and this is, this is something that I think the age community aged care community as a whole doesn't really understand is that um, the generational differences between the workers and the um, aged care um, recipi- uh, service recipients is the, um, the difference in attitudes amongst the generations. And uh, a lot of what I have to s- would have to say about aid care organisations has to do with um, um, the staff not understanding the attitudes and expectations or lack of expectations in a lot of cases that uh, aid care recipients have um, that are different from the, the generation of the people providing the services. Mm-hmm. And uh, perhaps we can talk about that in later on. But yeah, um, getting a, a, a cross reference from someone at who's who's had coal face experience with the provider. Um, Absolutely. So getting feedback from other people um, who you trust, um, and you know um, if they've had experience with a service. I think um, certainly I've heard quite a few stories where um, expectations have um, gone around communities about a service not being inclusive because someone had a a challenging experience um, or being really inclusive because one person did have a positive experience and then that message um, filters out into the community and can have a pretty powerful impact. Um, So that's a great point. And I think, um, Tony, that also leads really nicely into 
um, the next question I was going to ask, which is around why it's so important for aged care providers to understand the experiences and needs of older people. And I think that builds on what you were saying in terms of different expectations or potentially um, lack of expectations of providers. So I might ask Pauline to respond to that first and then we'll get some additional feedback if that's okay. I think one of the most important aspects that we have to remember is that service providers, particularly home-based and community-based service providers, are going into people's homes, into their potentially only safe place. And it's really important that they understand and meet the needs of as many communities and people as possible. And of course, we're talking about older LGBTI plus people today. Um, it's important that organisations, and I, I must um, say that specialisation verification is a really welcomed initiative. As you've outlined, Kate, prior to um, last year and um, and the full implementation this year, service providers could self-nominate. And what that meant was um, while there were some service providers that had actually done and achieved things like rainbow tick accreditation or at least ensured that their staff had attended training and education, that they had policies and procedures in place, that they provided inclusive, safe and welcoming services across the board from going into someone's home to perhaps the activities that they run. Many other service providers, it was a bit of a tick and flick approach. So this hopefully will enable many older LGBTI people and people from other special needs groups to be able to confidently access the care and support that they may be fearful to, um, to you know, knock on the door of. So I think that's a really important um, element. I wonder about what is unique about, and I wonder if this builds a bit um, on what Tony was saying, what is potentially unique about the experience of older LGBTI people that it's really important that providers understand? And that, I think that generational gap is really important that um, that younger people might not have had those same experiences or grown up in the same social context. Well, I think um, um, both Andrew and I deliver education all the time. And one of the things that we uh, focus on is history, not only the history, but the past history of social stigma and discrimination, where every um, all the people that we're talking about today were made wrong by every institution. And, you know, that was from um, every social institution and fundamentally right down to families. So a lot of older LGBTI people won't have um, informal support, so younger generations in their families to help them and assist them as they age, and therefore community aged care support services are even more important. So recognising um, that history, but that history also impacts on them now in a multitude of different ways. And they're things that we talk about in our training all the time. And it's important that service providers are aware of that and that people are, have for most of their lives um, been lawfully discriminated against. Andrew mentioned before that one of the things that we do at VELS is try and build the confidence of older LGBTI people to access the care and support that they need. And again, specialisation verification and all of the different um, criteria helps build, hopefully, over time, um, service providers that are committed to providing inclusive care and support and well equipped to do so. Yeah, which is um, really important to recognise the difference, I think, between being committed and being equipped um, and <laughs> being able to do that because um, having good intentions isn't really enough and it's not just about what happens at an individual staff member level as well. Um, it's also about, you know, having the organisation set up to enable staff to work in inclusive ways. A lot of service providers really want to do the best that they possibly can but pe perhaps don't have all the information at hand. And I think the criteria enables people to build that over time 
Um, of course, if you've got rainbow tick accreditation, that enables that 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 you've already achieved all of those things and much, much more. But this is an opportunity for service providers to be able to demonstrate in a multitude of different ways how they, that commitment and, um, and how they can um, really demonstrate this in a meaningful way. Andrew, Peter and Tony, do you guys have any other um, ideas about what you think the um, value of specialisation verification can be either for um, community members but also for organisations as well? I think one of the things picking up on something both you and Pauline have said is this enables organisations to commit to showing that they are inclusive, mm-hmm. that they are responsive to the requirements under the Act, to the things that have come in the aged care quality standards, and to publicly be declaring we are supportive of the diversity of all older people, and particularly, you know, in our case, the LGBTI community. Mm. And that helps build confidence in the organisations and in the aged care system, which then enables people who might be hesitant in approaching services to say, well, OK, they are doing things. One of the things that we know, Pauline and I often encounter this, is that many older LGBTI people don't understand that there has been a lot of work done by the sector, that it has become more and more inclusive, particularly over the last decade since LGBTI people were included as a special needs group in the Act. But there is that communication barrier. Older LGBTI people, because of the history that Pauline referenced, can be hesitant in believing that things are changing. They don't believe that things are changing. Specialisation verification will help build confidence in what you folk are doing and and a trust in that that is absolutely fundamental in having older LGBTI people, whether they disclose or not. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, Andrew. It's a, a really good point. Um, I remember my background clinically is um, as an OT and I remember going into somebody's home um, for the first time as quite a young OT and them saying to me, oh, such a relief. This is the first time I haven't had to de-gay my house when someone's come over. And I had absolutely no insight into what that meant or why that might have been happening. So it's um, certainly in my practice has been a real journey because um, I guess I have grown up um with different values and um innately it's common sense to me that everybody is different um and that's I guess the world that I choose to live in in lots of ways um but yeah I think that um us not understanding um and also aged care pro- recipients potentially not understanding the work that's being done and different perceptions One of the things that we also talk a lot about and are really trying to change is that there has been over the past decade or so a very strong narrative about fear. Oh, older LGBTI people are terrified of aged care and usually it's the going into aged care um, tagline Mm. and rarely is there any communication around um, rights and the requirements in the sector. And Andrew and I are really passionate about changing that because until we until we change that, until we can communicate, and again, specialization verification enables service providers to communicate what they're doing. But until we can communicate and change that, we are setting people up to either not access the care and support that they need. And therefore, they're more likely to end up in residential aged care. We're also not recognising the amazing work that's been done, and particularly in Victoria with um, and around diversity over the past decade. Mm. And it's um, really irresponsible. So we have to change that narrative. We have to stop and Um, journalists always contact us and say oh we want to talk to some older LGBTI people about their experiences and I say well I can put you in touch with people and 
they can talk about their good experiences and some about their bad. Oh, we only want to talk about the bad experiences and we have to change that. We have to stop that and we have to communicate that service providers are required to do this. Um, they're required to be inclusive mm. and um, and specialisation verification is a very tangible way for them to demonstrate that. And, of course, not all service providers will go down that path. But, um, again, it's about communicating that this is a requirement, bottom line. Service yes. providers can't discriminate. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that um, we all have um, responsibility that we hold in terms of that ongoing education around um, really, you know, even at the highest level, what aged care services and particularly community based aged care services are here to do. It's certainly that entire assessment and service delivery um, approach is not designed to catch people out and pop people into residential care if they you know, are not doing what we think they should be doing or whatever it might be. It is really about supporting people in a way that makes sense to them live the life that they want to live. Um, and part of that is obviously um, responding to diversity. So, yes, great point. If there was one thing that you would like to see aged care providers doing to be able to demonstrate that they are inclusive for older LGBTI people, what might that be? And I, I just want to acknowledge that I recognise this is simplistic, but just um, some practical suggestions. Show that they actually are. How do you think? Well, I actually thought about this. Great. And dare I actually even suggest, I live in a rural setting. Mm -hmm. there's, always, there's always something going on in the town where there's a stall. Um, it would be easy for the local providers to rock up with their flies and stuff or even some of their staff to sit there and talk to people. Why not? Rather than just saying on the system, and let's face it, that, that system that you showed us earlier on, I've been down that track, um, a lot of older people are not going there. If there was an obvious connection in the community by those providers, the people who are more timid are going to be far strengthened in their approach to those people. So show us that you are actually inclusive. Fantastic. Perhaps the people that come into our home may have a little badge on, mm -hmm. which is in is nothing but somebody sitting in that chair over there may see it and go oh boom yeah so rather than tell us that you're inclusive throw that show us yeah great that for me raises a um big bigger picture question around if we're going to give everybody badges um do we need to be prepared to back it up with good practice um because we don't want that tokenistic i can see andrew and pauline nodding enthusiastically I think if the only thing you do is wear a badge, you're probably um, really on the wrong track. But um, but I really like the idea of when you are set up to be inclusive, it's not about what you say, but having all of those cues to back you up makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you, Peter. Um, as the most um, enthusiastic nodder there, Andrew, um, what do you, would you like to add anything either um, about Peter's comment or something else that you would like to see from organisations to demonstrate they're inclusive? I'm going to take a slightly bigger picture view. Okay. I would like to see over the next little while more and more organisations actually commit to getting the specialisation verification. Great. There's so many people right around the country, right across the state of Victoria, are in areas where they would believe they don't have support with their aged care services, mm -hmm. you know, and the limited amounts of choice and so forth. I think one of the things that the aged care service providers can do because of what's been happening over the last few years in terms of, if you like, reputation damage to the sector to actually take a really positive stance and say, we are going to be doing these things will be really helpful 
mm. to everybody. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. Tony, I'm going to ask you next, what's the number one thing that you would like to say? It might appear to be tokenistic, but uh, one of the things that uh, I use and other people can use to sort of get a feel um, for uh, how, how, how inclusive an organisation is, is the way they address themselves and the way they address uh, aged care recipients. And uh, that is the simple uh, process. Just indicate their, their preferred pronoun, pronouns in all their communications. And if you're looking for a, a service provider and uh, you've got some of their documentation or something and it doesn't have that, that's sort of a warning sign that uh, they probably haven't done the rainbow tick or if they have, it's only been tokenistic. And, uh, yeah, um, that's a sort of practical thing that you can do and it, it applies um, all through um, um, your, your uh, experience with aged care providers. Thank you, Tony. Pauline, do you have a suggestion for that could round us out? To echo Andrew, um, commit to specialisation verification and achieving that for LGBTI populations. And my, I think the message that we have in all of our education and training, and we certainly hope that that will be bottom line for everyone, that all staff are, um, have attended training and education, we offer... Um, lots of free online training for CHSP service providers, lots of workshops. We've got lots coming up with regard to specialisation verification and all of the um, criteria and how you might achieve it. But the most important thing, that is all about committing to action. And that is always our message. You can't be inclusive if you don't do anything. So you've got to commit to doing something. And as you said earlier, Kate, service providers are already probably doing a whole range of these things and it's identifying what you are doing. But also if you, uh, if you don't know what to do or how to do it, if you don't know um, how you might achieve a certain um, criteria. Obviously, if you don't have rainbow tick accreditation, there's the other criteria. If you need assistance, Vels is here to help you. Um, you can contact us. We can provide consultation, advice, information. As I said, we have training. We really want you to achieve um, specialisation verification. It enables people to confidently access the care and support that they need. So most definitely, um, that's my wish list. Awesome. That's brilliant. And leads perfectly, Pauline, as if you knew what was going to happen, into a bit of a discussion around the application process. Just before we do that, I think um, the other thing just to acknowledge is um, there is lots of resources and support available. Lots of it is freely available to service providers as well. Even around um, rainbow tick accreditation, lots of the resources, even if you're not going to pursue full accreditation, there are lots of fantastic resources that can support you to understand what that might action might look like. There is also, as part of the aged care diversity framework, a number of action plans that sit underneath that. One of the things that's nice about those is they categorise their actions as sort of foundational actions. So whether people are right at the beginning of their journey in terms of becoming inclusive or really advanced and want to be leaders, there are um, a whole range of different actions and suggestions. So, yes, you don't have to um, navigate it alone, I think is probably a really important message because I know lots of agencies feel like it's perfect or nothing um, and nothing is not an option. Um, so um, it doesn't, you don't have to be, a, no one's 100% perfect. Can I support that, um, Kate, by saying that it's a journey, not a destination, that you, there's always something else to do um, with regard to inclusive practice. Yes, very good point. Thank you, Pauline.
I'm going to give you really um, the broadest overview um, in terms of the process for verification. Um, as Pauline mentioned, um, you will be facilitating some additional workshops that will look in more detail around uh, the process and the application and the different criteria, but I'm just going to give you the really big picture of it. In order to apply for verification, you need to submit an application which is done through the My Age Care portal. Um, you need to uh, decide on obviously uh, which special needs groups you want to apply for specialisation for and for um, each group there are um, different evidence um, requirements and criteria. So essentially you need to um, complete that um, form and upload your evidence and it doesn't need to be across all of your services. It might only be specific components or parts of your service as well. Um, so you get to um, choose which services that's relevant to. And then once you've submitted that application, AHA go through um, and assess your application. And there's also a process for them to collect feedback from um, clients and carers who are accessing your services. Um, so what happens there is that you will um, set up that process in the background, but your organisation are not the people that are collecting the feedback. It's AHA who actually um, speak to the um, service users and um, discuss their feedback with them. And then uh, within approximately four weeks, uh, you'll be notified of whether that has been successful. And uh, if so, then that um, tick is uh, shown on the Find a Provider tool. There are a whole a range of resources to be able to support you. Certainly the one that you can see on the screen, um, the aged care provider um, guidance manual walks you through step by step that um, requirements of the application process and all of the tools that are also available um, from the Department of Health and Aged Care's website as well. We've mentioned a couple of times that there are different criteria. I just wanted to give you the big picture of uh, the different tiers um, that you can apply for. So um, in terms of verification for LGBTI older people, uh, the two tiers are first tier is that you can demonstrate that you are rainbow tick accredited, which obviously means that you have completed um, that accreditation process separately, which requires you to complete a number of actions and demonstrate uh, inclusive practice separately. So if you are Rainbow Tick accredited, the process to therefore be able to get um, verification is really pretty simple. Um, alternatively, there are 11 additional criteria that you can provide evidence um, against. And what you need to be able to do is provide evidence that you meet four of the 11 criteria. So they are things, and we spoke about this earlier, but things like um, at least 90% of staff completing um, relevant training, and it's not one-off training, but it's annual um, ongoing training. Um, Ongoing engagement with the LGBTI community, which really leads nicely on from what Peter was mentioning before about having those clear connections and point of engagement and that, that there's that ongoing um, commitment to working with your local communities. Um, and another one is around how you um, not only have a commitment to supporting LGBTI people, but displaying that publicly. Um, it's uh, certainly things like um, having tools and systems and policies and procedures that guide specialised care, and that might be um, broadly for older LGBTI people and or for people living with HIV AIDS. It's actually identified as, a, um, as another criteria there. Um, participating in uh, local LGBTI celebrations and events, so whether it might be something like um, celebrating Ida Hobbit Day or whatever that might um, look like for you. Having um, LGBTI older people represented on your board um, and having um, an active ongoing advisory group and potentially as well having staff who are supported to be, um, who are or identify as LGBTI and are supported to be champions within your organisation. So again, it's not just about your practice one-on-one -on -one with clients, but when you look at the criteria, it's really about your organisation being set up 
to um, deliver services um, and design services that are inclusive. Is there anything that anyone wants to add around their criteria, knowing that that is obviously a very broad description? If I may. Yes, Andrew. Of the tier two criteria, for me as somebody who might in not too far distant future be looking for services, mm -hmm. One of the, the biggest ones I look for is the training of staff. Our staff, because as Tony said, it's that relationship. It's the person who's coming into the home. How inclusive are they? And ensuring that the staff have the necessary training to support them is, for me, one of the most vital things. I mean, there's lots of things in that tier too, but the training of staff, and their awareness and their capacity to be inclusive is perhaps the most fundamental one. Sure. And it certainly for me brings together the things that many of you highlighted as um, being important in terms of it's not just talking the talk, but really being able to walk the walk, you know, um, being able to show you and prove that you are in fact inclusive is reliant on your staff on the front line. Yeah, bringing it to the table. Pauline. People can always contact VELS. We offer free CHSP um, LGBTI awareness and inclusive practice training. And it is really important that staff have um, attended training to understand um, the experiences and needs of older LGBTI people, but also to understand the requirements of the sector that this is a requirement, um, hate to keep saying it, but it is a requirement that, um, and, and most people working with older people just want to make a difference in their lives and this can really help staff do that. Yeah, absolutely, Pauline. And that, I think, comes back really nicely to one of the first comments that you made in terms of um, we want services to be set up and equipped to be able to deliver care that is inclusive. Um, and that requires a multifaceted approach. And Lisa has just mentioned in the chat as well, it's not just the forward-facing staff that need to be trained, but right across the organisation. Um, you know, top down, bottom up, everybody needs to be on the same page. That's probably one of the most important things about making it work. Most definitely. And we are um, in the process of planning workshops and um, seminars around each of those tiers. Uh, well, sorry, each of the tier two um, criteria. Yep. So if organisations aren't confident to be able to or, or know what to do, um, we're going to have some really short, sharp, focused sessions on each of those. And as, as I've said all the way along, we want you to achieve this and we're going to help you do it. So please be in touch. Brilliant. Bigger picture, um, I, and I know I've mentioned this a couple of times, uh, already, but um, just really want to recognise that while everybody might not be ready or might not be ready right now to go down um, the path of applying for specialisation verification, understanding um, the framework and um, what it looks like and the different criteria is really beneficial for all organisations. It reminds us, I think, that. Um, it's not just about what we do face to face, but the way that we design services, um, our model of care and the way that we deliver them and also the way that we collect feedback and learn about what we're doing and what we could be doing better or differently or more of or less of are all really important components that, um, as Pauline said, it's a journey, not a destination. No matter how far down the track you are, there's always more to be doing and that everyone has a role to play regardless of um, your role in an organisation. Um, there is information in there that helps everybody demonstrate their alignment with the aged care quality standards. And I think it's um, really apt that I'm going to say Pauline's catchphrase is it's a requirement because it absolutely is. Um, this is not um, a bonus feature. You do need to be able to be demonstrating um, inclusive practice for all older people again, regardless of whether people choose to disclose um, any elements of their identity or not um, as part of um, our 
ongoing um, requirements and aged care quality standards. Because what we all want to do is deliver the best possible services that we can to um, our communities. And I don't think uh, many people are working in this sector for the glory and glamour and um, big paycheck. We're doing it because we're committed to that part. So um, that's you know important to keep in mind. The sales pitch is probably not the ticking the boxes, but making a difference. My role is, in, is to investigate the specialisation verification frameworks to see uh, how we can align. What I'm finding interesting is, and I totally understand what everybody's saying about um, if it's an inclusive practice anyway, which I totally understand against the standards, about disclosure. Yes, you don't want to when assessing, um, when the assessors are doing their questioning or when service setups occurring, you know, have a question about which do you identify any of the above. But then you see the criteria <laughs> and the criteria says it wants to talk to uh, care recipients who are LGBTI and report on the care they've received and meets their unique needs. So it, it also puts you in a spot where you're going to have to have uh, specific people singled out in your, in your whole service who are willing to disclose. You know what I'm saying? It's... Um, Yes, no one has to disclose, but we need people to disclose so we can approach them and say, would you please be happy to talk to our auditors? My understanding is you only need to meet um, four of the Tier 2 criteria. Um, and in my experience in working in community aged care, where we provided indications to people that our, you know, vis visual as well as um, languaging that our service was LGBTI plus inclusive, it didn't require people to disclose and it enabled them to access the service whether they wanted to disclose or not. Um, our service in going through Rainbow Cheek accreditation, you need to have people um, with regard to that process who will um, provide testimony that your service is inclusive and we just put out, um, sent out a, a survey, or not a survey, um, information to all of our clients, inviting them to contact um, a, a, um, one, one staff member um, and if they wanted to provide feedback. And if they didn't want to provide it to us as a service provider, how they could provide it um, through the process. When you're inviting consumers, I guess the key message would be if you invite everybody, it um, creates an opportunity for people to opt in if they would choose to, but they're not having to disclose necessarily. Um, and yeah, that's certainly the process that I have been familiar with in the past as well. And most definitely a lot of um, clients probably won't want to disclose or may not have disclosed to the service provider or to staff that they're working with more commonly to people that they regularly see who are providing care and support, but they may not want the service provider to know because of that history of discrimination. But if, as you said, Kate, if you put out a, a wider uh, net and invite everyone to participate, um, you may end up with um, people who, who can provide that feedback in a way that, in a way that meets their um, privacy and confidentiality. Yeah, I think as well, it also um, provides another really valuable potentially opportunity to reinforce your commitment to inclusion to your um, all of your consumers to be saying we're working towards um, specialisation verification and here's why. Um, that uh, demonstrates very actively that you are, um, whether or not you're currently considering yourself to be, you know, a hugely high achiever in the space, but it certainly um, reinforces your focus and commitment. So I think that in many ways, um, it's another way to message um, and build on what Peter was saying about prove it, show us. Um, yeah, that's a pretty clear message. Yeah, communicating to everyone for everything, not just the 10 or 35 or 92 LGBTI plus consumers that you think you might have, communicate it to everyone um, because there'll be people that won't have disclosed. There's always the possibility um, that 
getting accreditation for LGBTI um, might in fact help your staff because um, you may have members of that community in your staff that you don't you don't know are LGBTI. Um, so um, there's a there's a two way benefit potential there. Yes, great point, Tony. Um, and one of the criteria is around having um, LGBTI um, community, you know, staff members supported to be champions. Um, again, I guess, guess I would just echo um, what Pauline was saying before in terms of um, we also don't want to be forcing um, our staff members to disclose their identity either. Um, but, yeah, again, creating that opportunity for support and inclusion there is really valuable. Just one note of caution on using people who are from the community who are on your staff as the champions. Mm. Sometimes it can feel for people from the community like they are the ones who have to carry the work when, in fact, the work should be done by every staff member. Mm. Asking somebody from community to stand up all the time and be the one point of contact and all of that, unless you're rewarding them for it, is actually a burden for them that should be shared right across all staff. Yeah. All staff should yeah. understand the importance of this. This in practice can't be one or two staff members. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think uh, that um, is a really good point of it um, shouldn't need to be uh, community members that are responsible for the education of everybody else either, um, that we all have a responsibility to um, learn and upskill and be resourced ourselves. Something that I've seen happen more and more is that people have um, on their email signature, for example, um, a note next to their pronouns that says uh, a link to learn more about pronouns. And again, it's just a really nice opportunity to build in that education into your everyday practice. I really encourage you all to go away and have a think about what's next for you in terms of action, um, you know, whether that be specifically applying for specialisation verification or continuing that conversation back in your workplace as well. Um, this is the first of a series of eight um, workshops. Today has been a really fantastic um, example of the value of having experts to have a conversation with and learn from.